most amazing onstage host. You're totally going to dig her. Sarah Smith Robbins teaches in the IU Kelly School of Business. She is popularly known on Twitter as Intelligirl, and she is a brand new minted PhD. So Dr. Smith Robbins clearly has the wisdom thing going, and she is also all about play. Perfect, perfect onstage host for us. Please welcome Sarah Smith Robbins. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Bloomington. Indiana is in the house. And good morning to people online. We have an incredible show for you today, unlike any other thing you've ever seen. Um, our theme today is Wisdom of Play, which I think you've heard. And Bloomington is anything we're playful, right? We know how to have a good time, no doubt. Um, our first theme is wisdom, though. And our first speaker is a bit of an enigma. You won't even find his bio in your program, because if we shared it with you, we'd have to kill you. <laughs> because he's our resident ninja for today. Um, Stephen K. Hayes is going to talk to us about finding wisdom in unexpected places. Please welcome Stephen K. Hayes. Sarah's right. I'm not in here. You don't see me. You don't hear anything. I may not really be me. You know? When I was 15, uh, a friend of mine in uh, junior high school in a study hall slipped me this novel, and he said, hey, you got to read this. This is cool. I said, oh, sure. So I took this novel, and I started to read it. It was called You Only Live Twice. It was a James Bond novel, and I uh, started reading through it. It became more and more fascinating the more I read. So here's James Bond. He's a secret agent. And uh, his job is to protect the monarch and everything the monarch stands for. And they send James Bond over to Japan in this novel. And I'm reading this. Uh, and in Japan, so that he can deal with a real sneaky, uh, different kind of adversary, they want to train him in a different way of handling violence and so forth. So they, they arrange for him to study with the Togakure and the Iga Ninja. And so back in the early 1960s for this boring little kid from Ohio, and I'm reading this and it become more and more fascinating as I go along. And so then beyond that, they said, well, for him to fit in, what we got to do is we have to, they, they found a Japanese girl for him to marry. Oh, and she was beautiful. She was beautiful. And she spoke some English because she'd been in America for a year. And being an old-fashioned girl, she came back to Japan. And I'm reading this book, and it was painful. I mean, what a phenomenal thing. Oh, I wish I could do something with my own life. But it was a James Bond novel, and I was this boring little kid in an Ohio study hall. So eventually I put it aside and got on with my life. And, uh, you know, in your own life, how life takes over and we, we move ahead. And it was 30 years later, I started to re-examine. And I I'd looked at what had happened, and I had actually, uh, by a bunch of odd situations and coincidences moved to Japan and I had become the first American to talk my way into a 34 generation old tradition of protectors, the Togakure Ninja. And uh, when I was in Japan, I uh, met this beautiful girl and <laughs> <laughs> she was from the southern island of Kyushu I remember that because in the James Bond novel, this beautiful Japanese girl came from a sea coast harvesting village in Kyushu Island where it's kind of old fashioned. And this girl I met was from uh, Tenmei village on Kyushu Island where they harvested the sea. And she'd been in America as an exchange student <laughs> for a year. So we could, we could begin to speak. And uh, uh, eventually I convinced her to marry me. And then we came back, and a few years later, after some trips through Tibet and, uh, uh, and India, uh, I ended up 
in the late 1980s and through the 1990s, escorting His Holiness the Dalai Lama as his security advisor, uh, personal security escort, uh, sometimes right here in Bloomington. So here I was protecting the monarch. <laughs> so I always warn young ones, be real careful what you look at in study hall. Okay? <laughs> you might not get it, so. Any wisdom I've gained has come through playing around. Uh, I was so fortunate in my own life to be able to go places and do the things that brought out uh, the best in me, uh, that allowed me to be the me that I, I think I was supposed to be. Uh, so yeah, this is what I do. Uh, I studied the ninja martial art. I came back. This is before there were ninja turtles. You know, this is. <laughs> Before there was, uh, you know, the office ninja that you might work with. And, uh, a lot of people misunderstood what that was. And, and part of my job was to explain to people what the value, even today. Uh, I have a school where people can come and, and study this. But I usually don't tell them I'm a martial artist. You know, because they kind of back away. Oh, really? You know, they back away from me. And, uh, so, uh, so what I do is I tell people, uh, they say, what do you do? I say, well, I've got an institute where we teach uh, adventure-based personal development, leadership <laughs> skills. Oh, wow, now they want to come forward and find out what that is. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah. Life mastery through martial arts. But not everybody understands that. In fact, way back 30-some years ago, 1980, I came back from Japan, and uh, this ninja martial art was brand new on the martial art scene. Now, probably not a lot of you are martial art people, so you may not know that whole scene, but Black Belt Magazine invited me to come out to Los Angeles, and they wanted to do a cover story on the, the, the American who went and studied the ninja art. So, great, we, we, we left Los Angeles. We went up into the mountains, and we we're going to take this photo. And so they said, what do, we, what do you want to do? And I said, okay, here's, here's what it is. What's different about this martial art is we don't meet violence with violence, like standard martial arts might do. We're kind of sneaky. The idea is that we can feel and perceive and know what is happening, what an aggressor, what a confused, angry person would want to want to damage the world with, and we fit in. So how about this? I got this pose. I said, he's coming in like he's trying to kick, punch, and elbow me, and I've, I've kind of sneaked over the side, and I've captured him here where I can put a little pressure on the side of his neck. He goes unconscious and falls down and doesn't even know what happened. I thought this was so cool. They were bored to death. No, that won't work. That won't, won't work. No, no, people don't want to see that. They, they, they want to see a tough martial art. Or I say, well, it is tough, but it's tough in a sneaky way. No, no. <laughs> won't work. Nobody wants to see a sneaky martial art. Uh, you you got to be a ninja. No, well, I just explained to you what a ninja is, okay? <laughs> Nin, if you take that and you write it out in Japanese, it means to endure, to put up with things that would distract other people and, and cause them to get into fights and arguments and contests that they had no intention of getting into in the first place. So I explained this to him. No, no, it doesn't work. Um, well, what do you want me to do? Well, I think you should get behind him and choke him out with a ninja chain. <laughs> oh, geez. No, no, uh, see, what I would really, I explained that to him again, that uh, uh, that's kind of a cultural stereotype that really doesn't work necessarily. No, no. Uh, See, we could educate people as to what the real value of this is. They could take it out in their own lives and use it, not necessarily in combat, but, but certainly in any kind of a conflict. And he said, no, 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 we're not here to educate people. We're here to entertain them. They don't want to be educated. So, okay, all right, so let's do it. He says, we're losing our light. We've got to get this thing shot. Okay, so I get behind this guy, and I get my ninja chain, and I put it around his neck, and I'm choking him. All right. <laughs> And they go, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you doing? Uh, choking a person to death with my ninja chain, like you <laughs> asked me to do, you know? And uh, he said, no, no, with your face, your face. My face, what, what? He says, you're smiling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is working for me here. <laughs> if you have to fight a dangerous person, being behind him with a chain around his neck is a good place to be. <laughs> no, 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 you can't have a smile. You know, with this, people want to see... Uh, kind of a snarly, gnarly face, uh, ang you know. No, no, angry face is what the person who's losing has. <laughs> the winner has a smiley face. 
And they said, well, no, we, we can't have a smiling, uh, smiling warrior on the cover of the magazine. He said, and we're losing our light. Um, if we don't hurry up and get this thing done, we're going to lose our reservation down to Hollywood Sushi Restaurant. But, I mean, that's okay. We could go to Denny's and get a grilled cheese sandwich if you want. So part of wisdom is knowing what battle to just let go of. So I snarled and I strangled a guy and ended up on the 1980 Black Belt Hall of Fame magazine yearbook. So uh, wisdom, wisdom. <laughs> wisdom, I think, is, is knowing things and then paying a lot of attention. And this is what we encourage people with any of the books that I do or any of the uh, people I get to talk with. Pay attention and you study things. And because I've studied them, I know what to pay attention to because I've paid attention to. I now know what to go back and study. Uh, play, in, in my experience, isn't always something frivolous. We can play roles. Uh, I remember one time, one great lesson I got from the uh, watching the Dalai Lama. This would have been about 15 years ago, and I hadn't seen him for a year. And he was coming in. We were at a, a conference of, of Christian and Buddhist monastics down at Thomas Merton's monastery where he uh, is laid to rest. And so the plane lands, and I'm there on the security team. This is before we had the U.S. government doing that. So I met His Holiness the Dalai Lama at the door, and it had been about a year since I'd seen him. And he came out, and he was bent over like this, you know, and he came over and he saw me and he grabbed my hands and did a double handshake and I was a little surprised because here's this crowd of people and, you know, I hadn't seen him for a year and at that time he was 61 years old, but, oh, he'd gotten so old, you know, here he was kind of bent over and walking like this and, uh, oh, Buddhist impermanence lesson there, you know, and it was kind of touching because I had first met him when he was 50 years old and, uh, uh, so I escorted him through, and wherever he went with all of these other people, monastics, and uh, some you might even know, they've written books on uh, Buddhism and Christian, uh, how to work in the world. He was always lower than them, bowing. Always lower, and the people would have to bow even lower to shake his hand, and, uh, and I, I would escort him around. And one morning, I got up early, so they had, we had rebuilt the monastery. So there was like a new wall and a door. My room was here. And for anybody to get into where His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, was staying with his staff, they'd have to go past this door where I was. So I'd get up really early in the morning, and I'd have my suit and tie on, and I'd be there looking very official. And uh, so I'm getting ready, and I hear voices coming from down the hall. And it's, uh, it's like an argument. Now, I don't speak Tibetan, but it sounds very much like an argument, you know. This rumbling voice I was talking to this, this way. So, whoa, I, how'd they get by me? So I kind of casually walked over and I looked, down the, I, I looked down the door to see, and it's the Dalai Lama. And he's standing fully upright. And he's got his political staff there. And he's walking around. He has his counter beads. He's making points like this. And it was his voice. He's the king. And I see him and he's walking around very upright. And he stopped, and he looks down the hall, and there I am in the door looking at him like this. He's looking back at me like that, and he stopped right in the middle of the sentence. He smiled and went. <laughs> oh. Ah, the wisdom of playing different roles. Yeah, when you're the king, you better act like the king because the people expect that, and they're hoping you'll be the king. When you're in command, they, they hope that. And, and when you're a blessing presence, be that blessing presence. Be what they, they need, the people that you're helping. So whether you're a ninja or a king, or be there for them. So this is some of the wisdom that I've found from playing in my own life. I've been such a lucky person. Uh, I've gotten to do so many adventurous things, so many wonderful things in my life. And anything I can do to encourage others to do that, find that dream, follow that dream. Enjoy it. Share that motivation with others. Thank you so much. I so enjoyed talking with you tonight. Thank you.